The, um, the chorus, I owe my soul, I owe my soul to the company store, really could be the subtitle of the book and maybe the subtitle of the relationship that I see developing between um, the people of this country and its corporate, corporate government. So, I wrote Behind the Carbon Curtain, the energy industry, political censorship, and free speech over the course of five years. When I began, my purpose was to give voice to those who had been silenced, and in doing so, to catalyze change. Back in 2012, I couldn't imagine what was coming in terms of the assault on free speech that we are seeing today. But this book is not about conservative versus liberal values and politics. Rather, it's about the First Amendment, the soul of the American democracy, the universal human right to free speech, and the universal human wrong of censorship by whoever is in power. It is my hope that this book will become part of a growing conversation taking place in newspapers and magazines, websites, film, radio programs, and television shows, a conversation that is beginning to knit together a dark tapestry of oppression. On a more personal and local scale, through the real-life stories in this book, I hope that my readers will come to realize how their own experiences and those of their neighbors are being woven into a fabric of silencing dissent. You know, without hearing stories, we might each presume that our fear to speak out, our reticence to protest injustice, or our decision to quietly avoid offending those who provide our paychecks, well, it's just a matter of our individual conditions. But I'm here to tell you that a pattern is emerging. And we need to hear from others to understand that we are in this together. Now, these stories and my analysis will not change society, at least not these alone. But maybe as part of a national narrative that includes the families in Pennsylvania, driven from their homes by leaking methane and who energy companies compensate only in exchange for their silence. The nation's story includes the citizens in West Virginia who were sued for libel by a coal company for criticizing the industry in a community newsletter. And our country's narrative involves the professor in the University of Oklahoma's ConocoPhillips School of Geology and Geophysics, ConocoPhillips School of Geology and Geophysics, who was intimidated into silence when an oil tycoon and major donor to the University of Oklahoma demanded the dismissal of scientists studying the link between fracking and earthquakes. Free speech is under attack by the energy industry across the nation. Now, social and political change often begin with stories. The philosopher Richard Carney maintains that, and I quote, telling stories is as basic to human beings as eating. More so, in fact, for while food makes us live, stories are what make our lives worth living. And perhaps he overstates the case. But narratives are how we understand ourselves and find our place in the world. Shared stories stitch together communities, begin conversations. They move us to tears, sometimes to action. Scholars have long been writing, speaking, and teaching about institutional racism, but what catalyzed change in America were stories. The stories of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Walter Scott in South Carolina, Eric Gardner in New York, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Laquan McDonald in Chicago. The list goes on. No single story was sufficient. The protests in Ferguson would likely have faded into the national consciousness, dismissed as a local aberration without the other accounts. And so my book is a chapter in an emerging narrative of how the energy industries, and in a more general sense, corporations, and we should include big pharma and big ag in there, how these industries silence public discourse. As a New York Times story noted, citizens in the energy-rich West have been, quote, ignored, ridiculed, threatened, and paid settlements in exchange for silence. A typical example is the woman who angrily but silently attended the one million barrels celebration of oil in North Dakota, later telling a reporter, I'm not that brave or stupid to protest. We're outgunned, outnumbered, and outsuited. Well, you know, we might be outsuited, but I'm less sure that we are outnumbered. At least if we, 
include citizens from the left, the center, and the right. Citizens who believe deeply that free speech is fundamental to a vibrant democracy. This is the kind of patriotism that transcends party politics because it touches the core of human dignity. Through a series of interrelated narratives, I'll tell the stories of real people who have suffered the oppression of censorship through the collusion of business and government. My purpose? My purpose is to provide witness, to record events, to give voice, and in so doing to shift the balance of power ever so slightly, to bring us closer to a tipping point of outrage and change. I'll share with you seven short vignettes from the varied and disturbing tales of censorship in Wyoming. The context around each of these excerpts is rich and complex, but I think the distilled scenes I'll give you this afternoon provide a sense of what is happening in my state and from what I've read, perhaps yours as well. And then I'll finish with some thoughts about the larger questions that are raised and actions that we might take wherever we live. First story. In July 2011, Chris Drury came to Wyoming with an evocative concept for his art installation titled Carbon Sink, What Goes Around Comes Around. Along with a cadre of dedicated assistants, Drury laid out a 36-foot diameter vortex of charred logs from beetle-killed trees interspersed with coal to give the sensation of a whirlpool spiraling into the blackened earth. The artist was drawing a connection among fossil fuels, climate change, and the beetle outbreaks driven by warmer winters in Wyoming's forests. Stories in the Casper Star Tribune, our largest paper, and the Gillette News Record, our second largest paper, featured elected officials declaring that the sculpture, which none of them had actually seen, was, quote, an insult to the tens of thousands of people across Wyoming that work hard to produce energy, and that politicians needed to, and again I quote, educate folks at the university on where their paychecks come from. The legislators from Gillette left little doubt that the university was going to pay a price if carbon sink remained on the University of Wyoming's campus. Tom Lubnow, the House Majority Floor leader whose political campaigns had been underwritten by the energy industry, explained that the legislature had simply been trying to educate those, in his words, pointy-headed academics by letting them know that between 60 and 80 percent of the state's budget is dependent on extractive industries. What Lubnow failed to grasp is that the faculty are keenly aware that our salaries are linked to fossil fuels, and it's this very complicity that explains why I and others felt compelled to speak out. Now, Lubnow insisted that his linking of the energy industry's outrage to university funding had been twisted into an imaginary threat, but the top administrators clearly took the threats for real. He claimed to be a victim of persecution by uppity eggheads. His use of uppity seems painfully revealing in terms of how he perceived the relationship between the legislature and the university. The shift from outrage to threats was unmistakable in messages from industry. The president of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming emailed a who's who list of corporate executives and wrote that, quote, the University of Wyoming hides behind academic freedom, but their policies and actions can change if they so choose. But can a university anywhere renounce such a fundamental liberty and maintain its integrity. The energy industry strong-armed the University of Wyoming's art museum who sponsored the carbon sink sculpture. A well-connected member of the museum's board who had spoken with key executives at Arch Coal, Anadarko, BP America, and Cloud Peak Energy reported to the board, quote, I have been asked to request that this display, carbon sink, be removed from the University of Wyoming property. And so the university's president, Tom Buchanan, quietly ordered the destruction of the artwork and the museum's director scheduled the removal for May 21st with no press planned. The timing was brilliant. With graduation scheduled for May 5th, the craven act of censorship would happen after the students had left and few faculty were on campus. While the people of Wyoming weren't notified, the politicians 
who had demanded the suppression of speech were informed. The president's spokesman trumpeted the destruction of carbon sink in an email to the most ardent legislators from energy-rich counties, writing, I want to inform you that today, the temporary carbon sink artwork on UW's campus is being demolished. In response to a concerned alumnus who noticed the absence of carbon sink, the university's director of government and community affairs simply lied explaining that the removal was because, and I'll quote his email, an adjacent irrigation line recently broke and adversely impacted the sculpture. When the inept cover-up was revealed, the director of the School of Energy Resources maintained that, in his words, those who either directly or indirectly provide funds for the university have a reasonable expectation that they can control messages that the university sends. Let me tell you that again. It applies to all public institutions that increasingly depend on these outside monies. He said, those who directly or indirectly provide funds for the university have a reasonable expectation that they can control messages the university sends. It appears that Mark Northam's view is that speech is for sale and the energy industry is the highest bidder. Catalyzed by the destruction of Carbon Sink, a resolution in support of academic freedom came before the university's student senate. The most deeply troubling line of argument began with a student senator who said that after discussing the matter with state legislators, he was, quote, warned against biting the hand that feeds us. Another senator put it in stark terms, I agree with the principle of academic freedom, but urge a no vote. Do you want to bite the hand that feeds you? Students had come to perceive themselves as domesticated animals, fed on low tuition through energy taxes. The resolution failed to pass by a single vote. In our second vignette, nobody would have foreseen a problem unless they were privy to emails from the chairman of the State Board of Education in February of 2014. Ron Michael, I objected to the inclusion of climate change as fact rather than theory in the next generation science standards. And he insisted that, quote, the ice pack is expanding and the climate is cooling, based on reports from the right wing Fordham Institute. In the waning minutes of the spring legislative session, Wyoming's politicians passed a budget footnote prohibiting the use of state funds to implement the next generation science standards. The bill's author explained that the standards treat, quote, man-made climate change as settled fact. We are the largest energy producing state in the country, so are we going to concede that? At issue was not the veracity of science, but the vitality of the energy companies. The governor defended the use of ideological indoctrination in our public schools with a rhetorical question. Are the next generation science standards, he asked, going to fit what we want in Wyoming? When the Wyoming Board of Education subsequently solicited input from citizens, legislators insisted the meeting was illegal. The politicians maintained that they had the authority to quash dissent and demanded that the board, quote, obey the law and silence the crowd. Well, to his credit, Ron Michael I allowed public comment. However, he might have been wise to remain mum at the public meeting as he insisted that the discussion had to be fair and balanced. And, quote, based on the economy of this state, Again, not on the findings of science. His voice rose as he declared that Wyoming's entire educational system is based on fossil fuels and any attempt to derail that or change that is not in the best interests of the state. Our third story begins with Dr. Jeff Thine, a research scientist with the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, EORI, in the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming. In 2001, he was contacted by a reporter from the Cheyenne Tribune Eagle who was investigating the development of an enormous gas field in southeastern Wyoming. When she asked Thine how much water would be needed for fracking, he offered a range of figures based on the available scientific literature. After the story came out, the university's vice president for government communications and community affairs Notify the School of Energy administrators that Noble Energy and the Petroleum Association of Wyoming were on the warpath 
having traced the offending figure to Dr. Thine. Thine explained to the frenzied administrator, administrators that he'd, and I quote, made the comments based on my experience as a member of the scientific advisory board for the current EPA hydraulic fracturing study. He knew of which he spoke. In response, Thine was informed that he'd be the guest of honor at a gathering of university officials and industry representatives. The Petroleum Association of Wyoming, a major political supporter whose members were beneficiaries of EORI, was represented by Jonathan Ekstrom of Noble Energy and Jody Levin from a lobbying and public relations firm. The, view, the university contributed two vice presidents and the director of the School of Energy along with his subordinate director in EORI. After initial pleasantries, Ekstrom got down to business and told Thine that he was wrong about the amount of water that would be used for fracking the Niobrara shale. Now, as a scientist, Thine said he was, that being wrong was an occupational hazard. And then he asked for the data. The industry representative simply insisted that Thine was off by an order of magnitude and offered no evidence. The scientist was ordered by the university officials to write a full retraction. Mark Northam, the director of the School of Energy Resources, told Thine, quote, I will edit your letter and you will sign it. You shouldn't have said anything and don't say anything ever again. The director rewrote the letter, striking references to Thine's expertise about fracking and repeating his earlier statement that Thine did not represent the university. Thine relented to the changes, but, but he refused to retract his estimates of water usage by the energy industry without data. Soon after, Thine was called into the office of the EORI director and told, quote, we're not going to renew your contract. When Thine asked for an explanation, his supervisor replied, I don't have to tell you why. He was right, having been tutored by the central administration. When Thine suggested the issue was being blown out of proportion, his boss became angry and he gave the explanation. The scientist was seeking, but the university wanted to deny. He said, the director of the School of Energy gets a lot of money from these oil companies and you are screwing with that our next vignette. I am writing this letter in hopes that you will stop his foolish, self-serving attempt to cast doubt on the DKRW project, which is very important to Carbon County, the state of Wyoming, and our entire country. Please address this issue with Dr. Throgmorton, as it is very important to the way we in Carbon County appear to the rest of the world. The letter from the Carbon County Commission demanding that the board of the county's higher education center censor their director was sent on May 1st, 2012. The irony of their concern that obstructing industry would be more shameful than suppressing free speech was not lost on Gilbert Archuleta, the self-effacing chair of the board who played a pivotal role in what eventually transpired. The county commissioners agree that their chairman, Terry Wycombe, wrote the letter, hence the use of I in the text. However, their stories diverge when it comes to the conversation that culminated in all three of them signing the document. How a group of elected officials came to publicly call for silencing a critic of a major energy project is important to understanding censorship in contemporary America. This chunk of Wyoming might seem geographically isolated and culturally unique, but I'd suggest that every state has at least one carbon county. The politicians weren't clear on exactly what they wanted to have happen following their letter. Presumably, they were all thinking about the power wielded by Wyoming's county commissioners who are tight with the movers and shakers. And in Carbon County, that means the energy industry. BP, Devon Energy, Sinclair, and of course, this company, DKRW. A company led by former Enron executives with a half-baked plan for an enormous facility to convert coal to gasoline while bilking millions from the Wyoming Treasury. When Gilbert Archuleta received the letter from the county commissioners demanding that the Higher Education Center silence their director, he was incredulous. His reply to the county commission endorsed by his entire board provides an object lesson in courage and integrity. He wrote, we share a common goal of acting in a manner that serves the needs of all the county's citizens. A distinction has to be made, however, between opinions expressed as an individual citizen and those expressed 
in an official capacity. We are certain you agree with the premise that it is a fundamental duty or right of any citizen to question the actions of our governing bodies regardless of who the individual is. Dave Throgmorton stopped writing his newspaper column. He says, I have a responsibility to the Carbon County Higher Education Center to have a good relationship with British Petroleum and a good relationship with Sinclair and a good relationship with Devon Oil and all of these places, Throgmorton says, and his voice softens. Every time I sit down to write about something controversial, I'm suddenly thinking, who am I going to alienate with this one that is going to do us damage? See, political censorship is unconscionable, but self-censorship is an insidious silence that eats away at the integrity of a community, a state, a nation. When people stop speaking for fear of reprisal from corporations or their political allies, we are all in deep trouble. Press release, January 9, 2006. The UCross Foundation Art Gallery will open its season with an exhibition of photographs. The new gold rush, images of coal bed methane. The show will travel in the fall to the Nicolaisen Art Museum in Casper, which is the state's largest art museum. Associated Press, February 7, 2006. The intent of the show, sponsors and artists say, is to educate people about how the land has changed in the decades since drilling began taking off. Some in the industry have written off the show as an attack even before seeing it. Casper Star Tribune, February 8, 2006. Casper's Nicolay's and Art Museum and Discovery Center canceled a photo exhibit featuring coal bed methane development in northeastern Wyoming amid criticism that it's meant to give the industry a black eye. Nicolaisen director Holly Turner said, there was no pressure from the museum supporters in the oil and gas industry to drop the exhibit. Hmm. But according to Ben Mitchell, the curator of the art collection, quote, the feedback I received was petulant and angry. He maintains that, in his words, enormous, powerful influences brought to bear on the board and the director. First came an invective-laced call from a state senator, and then came an onslaught of thuggish calls from Anadarko Petroleum Corporation and other energy companies. And behind the scenes, the McMurrays, one of Wyoming's wealthiest oil and gas families, was quietly taking out a hit on the art show. When Holly Turner's story began to crumble, she turned the tables and asserted that censorship was justified because the new Gold Rush exhibit had, quote, political overtones, as if censorship had none. Her position was that activist photographers were dragging controversy into a museum filled with apolitical art. Mitchell found this ridiculous, arguing that having a point of view, in his words, can never be used as an excuse to silence an artist's voice or to stifle open, free, and complex dialogue. And then he adds, let's also remember an awfully simple thing. The works in the new gold rush were straightforward documentary photography. The oil and gas industry created the scenes that the artists recorded. In the end, Mitchell let the museum director control the message because revealing the role of industry risked the very life of the museum. He said, oil and gas interests were so supremely powerful and vindictive that they could kill the Nick. He says, I underestimated the willingness of industry to undermine the roots of democracy and overestimated the principled courage of an art museum in a company town. Today he regrets having allowed money to buy a silence, believing that self-censorship, in his words, left a weakened institution and a weakened cultural community in Wyoming. Shortly after the cancellation of the new gold rush, Ben Mitchell resigned. Our sixth vignette begins with those winter days in Pinedale, Wyoming, when masses of ozone slid into the streets and neighborhoods from the gas fields above town. Breathing the air became the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. But while lungs hacked and noses bled in the dark days of the recession, Wyoming enjoyed low unemployment rates and billion-dollar budget surpluses. 
Sublette County's tax valuation increased from $379 million in 1999 to more than $2 billion in 2005. The 7,000 residents of the county were treated to a remodeled courthouse, a fancy ice arena, a newfangled senior center, and a lively discussion about artificial turf for the high school. The influx of gas workers stretched the health care infrastructure and the courts wallowed in DUIs, batteries, and drug-related arrests. Methamphetamine is useful when working 12-hour shifts for two straight weeks. To a guy driving a truck, 35 bucks an hour is good income. And to the energy industry, it's cheap hush money. But when this wasn't sufficient, the industry took more direct measures to silence obstreperous voices. For example, a gas field manager stopped by the Ford dealership to tell the owner that it would be good for business if the fellow would quiet down his father, an irascible legislator who sometimes spoke ill of the gas industry. While the company silenced dissenters through extortion, the government quashed research through defunding. Dr. Robert Field, an atmospheric scientist at the University of Wyoming, discovered that ozone was being produced from methane leaks in the gas fields. He also learned that when it comes to talking about the detrimental effects of natural gas drilling, in his words, the louder you are, the more it comes back. So I've been very quiet. He struggles with being paid by the public, but unable to deliver information crucial to social well-being and health. But Field's paycheck depends on grant funding, and, as he puts it, I'm not into Harry Carey. So he abandoned his studies on the Pinedale Anticline. Our final vignette begins with the university's Office of Water Programs. To assure silence, this operation was headed by a committed climate change denier. Greg Kerr, an agricultural engineer, dismissed the findings of the Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Climate Change, the world's leading set of experts, by saying, in his words, all these climate change models look like a bunch of spaghetti. As for the loss of Wyoming's glaciers that are vital to the state's water supply, he wrongly asserts that temperatures have declined over the last 50 years. Then he defended the fossil fuel industry by asking, as if this was a serious question, he asked, are we going to stop energy production and starve to death? Likewise, the director of the Small Business Grant Program at the university's Office of Research and Economic Development publicly asserts, and I quote, Governor Matt Mead has the courage of his convictions in disclosing that he hasn't partaken of the Al Gore junk science Kool-Aid propaganda with respect to human-caused global climate change. Ask any faculty at the UW School of Energy Research. With the university administration convinced that any mention of climate change was politically untenable, Dr. Steve Gray was in a rather difficult position. As the state climatologist, Dr. Gray tried to fulfill his obligations to the people of Wyoming and speak about climate change in the most diplomatic terms, but he was met with fierce resistance from his own institution. Eventually, Dr. Gray realized that, quote, there was no chance to expand the program to better meet the state's needs. He left Wyoming for the U.S. Geological Survey's Climate Science Center in Alaska, where he says, quote, it's not hard for people to see the relevance of climate change when your village is falling into a river as the permafrost melts. And so it was, and so it was, that Steve Gray was the last state climatologist in the, of Wyoming, his post being unfilled since 2011. Well, let me, offer, oops, let me offer a few concluding thoughts. Censorship is nothing new in America, but what seems to be changing is our acceptance of its various guises. Maybe this complacency is related to our new relationship with, en with information and privacy. And this could be why it seems unremarkable that public workers who are fired when they speak to the press, that artworks are removed because companies are offended or teachers are prohibited from telling their students about climate change. But the more troubling explanation is the emergence of a government that is no longer for the people. We live in a time in which policy is seen to be in service to the market and people take it to be normal that almost everything is treated as a commodity including speech. The commodification of public and private life took root when the Cold War was ending. 
Industrial nations bought into the metaphor of society as business. We would all be better off when citizen consumers could choose via their purchasing power among educational, medical, and transportation opportunities. By the turn of the century, I'm sorry, by the turn of the millennium, individuals could rent wombs. Cities could sell the names of civic space, and companies could buy the right to pollute. And in the frenzied marketplace, the energy industry purchased academic positions, scientific questions, and classroom curricula, as well as the power to censor public art, dismiss university scientists, and silence educators. You know, the core tenet of the market mindset is that commercialization does not change the character of whatever is being bought or sold, but markets crowd out moral judgments. If speech is commodified, then its value and function in a democracy are profoundly altered. And in the starkest sense, what was once free speech, an activity in which every individual had a right to engage, it becomes the property of those who purchase it. And just as allowing sex to be purchased changes how we understand this activity and ourselves, <coughs> excuse me, so it is with speech in all of its varied forms. Outside my office window at the university is a plaza in front of the student union. When the weather is decent, fundamentalist preachers and political ideologues perch themselves on a box or bench and pronounce their beliefs. I can hear them through my window. But they soon blend into a kind of white noise. Well, they do until passing students decide to engage their would-be saviors. The shouting and the arguing becomes a cacophony of shambles, every, except that if one listens attentively, each voice is responding to another. They're all being heard at some level, even if few minds are changed. See, democracies are noisy and inefficient. But they allow the formation of communities in which ideas can be presented, challenged, accepted, or dismissed on their merits rather than their price tags. But with the concentration of wealth comes the consolidation of speech. As media scholar Sue Curry Jansen contends in her book Censorship, The Knot That Binds Power and Knowledge, quote, we are now witnessing the removal of the last vestiges of social pluralism and the emergence of a monolithic society in which the market is the measure of all things. That is, America is at last fulfilling Adam Smith's vision of a society in which the rules of the marketplace become the rules of civil society. Modern concerns echo voices raised during the Industrial Revolution. As people realize the deal being struck between humanity and business, in 1806, William Wordsworth warned, the world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. And today we have exchanged our liberty for the sordid boon of fossil fuels. And nowhere is this more evident than in Wyoming, a harbinger of what is coming to a nation with banks that are too big to fail and industries that write our laws but perhaps there's hope. Prompted by years of legislative and corporate meddling, journalists have seen what the commodification of speech means for our fundamental freedoms, and they've begun to raise their voices. The editorial board of the Wyoming Tribune Eagle, the paper of the state's capital, put it in stark terms when they wrote, what is the value of academic freedom? That's the question all Wyomingites should be asking themselves. To state lawmakers, it is a commodity that can be bought and sold like coal or oil. What was once non-negotiable at UW now has a price tag on it. Lawmakers have sold the school to the highest bidder, the energy industry. The journalists also recognized the capacity, oh, I'm sorry, the journalists also recognized the capacity to silent dissidents' voices had become an instrument of wealth and power. The newspaper incisively portrayed the insidious nature of self-censorship on the university campus. They wrote, in fact, several members of UW's faculty refused to be interviewed for the article, fearing repercussions. And can you blame them? When lawmakers threatened to cut funding to UW for allowing a sculpture on campus critical of the energy industry, the faculty gets the message. Speak up, and it could be you next time. My colleagues in the Department of Philosophy and the Creative Writing Program have been adamant 
that they will take whatever comes rather than asking me to be quiet. Living behind a carbon curtain of silence is too high a price to pay. Mike Sullivan described Wyoming as, quote, a small town with very long streets. As a governor from 1987 to 1995, he was considered a moderate. Even so, his connections to the energy industry ran deep, and they still do. Sullivan earned a bachelor's in petroleum engineering and a law degree from the University of Wyoming. In his post-gubernatorial career, he serves on the board of directors at Cimarex Energy, a multi-billion dollar oil and gas exploration and production company. In 2013, he signed on to a letter calling for the Obama administration to accelerate coal production. It would seem that Governor Mike Sullivan was almost right about his home state. Wyoming is a small company town with long streets. Now, my book tells the stories of artists, scientists, and educators censored by the energy industry in collusion with the government. Perhaps some readers will be unsurprised, but I hope that many are disturbed, even outraged. If I've succeeded, these people will be wondering, what's next? What can anyone in a small town or a large state or a massive nation do about the silencing of our voices? Well, let me start by saying, I don't know. I'm not a social scientist. But from the stories in this book, it would appear that there are two structural defects that foster censorship at least in Wyoming and probably elsewhere. First, the hegemony of the energy industry, of any, in, of any industry, is undoubtedly a contributing factor. A diversified economy would mitigate this concentration of power, but exactly how Wyoming can achieve this outcome is a decades-old puzzle that economists and political scientists have yet to solve. The second defect pertains to the connection between political elections and corporate money. And this is everybody's problem. This is a challenge to our democratic government and capitalist e economy that is also beyond my realm of expertise, not to mention it would be the subject of another book altogether. Social scientists might be able to find ways of disconnecting politics and business, but I suspect the solutions will require great insight in, nu in nuance, or more likely, a constitutional amendment. And so what about the rest of us? I don't claim to know how movements arise, why they succeed. I suspect that such phenomena are much easier to explain after the fact than to predict in advance. That said, three elements of social action are worth considering. These insights might lack radical originality, but sometimes novelty is overrated. First, with regard to free speech, Nothing is likely to change except for the worse if we don't recognize that there is censorship. Those in power do not willingly give up their capacity to control material and social resources. The rich get richer in terms of money and influence. So, share my book with friends and neighbors, but more importantly, share your own story. I suspect that the practice of censorship is among the most challenging of injustices to address. How do we raise our voices when the problem is people are being silenced? If a person fears retribution, then speaking out is not an easy task, but it is incumbent on us to object in some way to whoever we think might listen. Maybe it is at the dinner table or during a coffee break or after Sunday service or in a Rotary Club meeting or through a letter to the editor, but say something. Second, we should heed the wisdom of Margaret Mead who said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Now, massive protests on the Mall of Washington, D.C. are great, but big changes often arise from the accumulation of small actions. I don't know if we can fix censorship in Wyoming without national legislation, if we can stop corporations from effectively purchasing election results without a constitutional amendment. But then, had the people of Ferguson, Missouri waited for Black Lives Matter to become a national movement, they'd still be sitting quietly in their homes. You see, we must begin to solve problems for which the solutions are yet to be imagined. Third, as a university professor, I'm irresistibly drawn to the power of education. I worry that young people don't grasp the nature or importance of free speech. 
Surveys by the First, American Center, First Amendment Center have been profoundly revealing and worrying. Although almost half of Americans name free speech as the most important liberty, more than a third cannot name any of the rights guaranteed by the First Amendment. And in terms of the need for education, young people tend to more strongly agree that the Constitution goes too far with our freedoms. While half, 50% of 18 to 30 year olds believe the First Amendment overreaches in the rights it guarantees, just a quarter of older Americans agree. And when Americans are afraid, their tolerance of First Amendment rights declines even further. After the Boston Marathon bombing, there was a sharp jump in the proportion of people who thought the First Amendment excessively protected our freedoms. And after September 11th, 40% of Americans favored restricting the freedom of professors to criticize the government's military policy during war. Today, two-thirds of Americans rate the educational system as doing only a fair to poor job in teaching students about the First Amendment. Knowledge of the U.S. Constitution is trending downward. And as the country becomes, less, becomes uh, more diverse, free speech may further erode. See, African American and Hispanic people are more likely to say the First Amendment overreaches. Fully 50% of these minorities believe the First Amendment goes too far, while only 30% of whites agree. The task of educators is daunting. Perhaps students who read my book will be unperturbed. What can you expect when you bite the hand that feeds you? But I also worry that students will just be perplexed, asking, don't employers have a right to decide what their employees can say? Maybe I'm being uncharitable, but remember the effect of fear on our tolerance for oppression. Today, Donald Trump is tapping into fear of economic decline illegal immigration, unfamiliar religions, other races, strong women, and social change. If we do not defend freedom in our classrooms, we may well lose liberty in our towns, our states, our nation. There are three caveats that I want to conclude with for those wanting to take action in response to corporate-sponsored censorship by politicians or by government agencies. My first, be careful. No viable ethical system requires self-destruction. My job is to secure, my job is secure thanks to the privilege of tenure granted by the citizens of Wyoming for whom my book is intended in partial fulfillment of my obligations to them. But this is not the case for most people who are at-will employees around the country. Heed the admonition of General George Patton to U.S. troops in 1944 when he said, no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor bastard die for his country. And second, be courageous. It is also true that no action is morally praiseworthy if one stands to lose nothing. Justice entails struggle while remaining silent is safe, of course. For some people, perhaps many, other demands on their lives make the risks of social action untenable. As Socrates recognized centuries ago, courage is profoundly contextual. Each person must decide what free speech is worth compared to the cost of speaking out. But as Marianne Williamson wrote, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. My third, my final caveat, concerns the nature of commitment. In working toward a more just world, we often yearn for the completion of our task. We pin our hopes on success, on seeing the fruits of our labor. We aspire to make our town, our state, our nation into a place where people can express themselves without fear of retribution. But the work of social justice will never be done. That is the curse and blessing of being human. It's a curse in that there, was, there is no completion of our labors. It's a blessing in that there shall always be meaningful work. And finally, to know what we can do, to understand what the world needs of us, we must hear the muted voices of our neighbors, read the accounts of destroyed art and suppressed science, listen for what can't be said in our classrooms. But to sustain our work, we must look inside ourselves. 
There we shall find the understanding that world-making is self-making, that the endless labor of life is about sustaining our own dignity. It is good to cultivate freedom, whether or not it fixes a broken democracy. Thank you.